Let's hear it for Alberta Street Pub. These guys, is this, is this sound right? Does this sound good? Okay. Um, nobody's ever told me I'm soft-spoken, so I don't really have to worry. Um, I'm Mara. There's a lot of new people here. Um, can you turn up the house lights for a minute? And I'm going to ask how many people are first time to first Monday? Awesome. That's great. Thank you so much for coming. Yeah. Everybody else, all the veterans, you know what to do. Loop them in. Um, now, I mean, this is, this is really a movement. It is about connecting. And our power comes from our solidarity. Our power comes from strategic engagement. And our power comes from knowing each other and reminding ourselves that we're not alone. Because um, music is hard. And we're trying to make it easier, but it's, it's still pretty hard. And it's important for people to know each other, support each other, and remind ourselves why our community is amazing. So thank you all for coming. For any of you that have not yet dropped the big coin and become a paying member of Music Portland for a scant $25 a year or $3 a month, please do it. I can't tell you how much it matters. You know, you might think like, oh, it, you know, it, how much can that matter? You know, it's a couple of, it's a PBR a month. Think of it that way. Um, but it really does. It makes a huge difference. There are enough of us that we can fund this entire thing effectively and stop me from working 14 hours every day by, if everybody just chips in a little bit. So please make sure it's musicportland.org forward slash individual. And you can do it while you're here, and I'll go home and be just so excited to see all the, the things flurrying in. It would be really great. A um, lot of stuff continues to go on. We are collating a bunch of things from a bunch of the feedback groups we've had about the um, regional cultural plan, which is the city's planning process for how it deals with culture. Um, but never before has it included popular music because we're apparently not culture. But um, we've been standing together and fighting for it, and now we are invited to the table. And we have some incredible feedback from people. And I know that Rebecca back there also can point you at a survey. If you have ideas around audience development, artist relations, venue relations, or music business support, let us know, because we're now developing into sort of fully fleshed recommendations to give to the city to build into this plan to say this is what we're going to need to sustain our popular music culture in the years to come because we can't do it without some really direct funding um, which leads me beautifully seamlessly into a conversation about the new ways that it's necessary for musicians to think about making money it used to be you could sell your recorded media you'd play some shows you can make a living wage you maybe put your kids through college um, Let's have a hand count. How many people can do that now? Yeah. Um, yeah, it's it, one of the things that um, we've been finding in the economic study that just came out at the state level that was linked to from the newsletter. Did everybody get the newsletter that's in here? Are you guys all seeing it? If you are not seeing it, it may be going into your spam folder. So check out and make sure that we are doing it because there's going to be more and more really important information. Um, our new grant program will be probably cycling up in June and um, lots of other great things happening. Next month's first Monday is on um, contracts and accounting. There's some amazing new tax codes that have come through that mean if you're unable to perform um, for a couple of months, you can get paid. So make sure that you come to that. It's really, I think it's it's a little dry, but it's important stuff. And everything is also about leveling up our professionalism to survive, because you can't do it casually anymore. There's a difference between hobbyists and professionals, and we're really trying to support the professionals. And part of that is understanding what the heck is going on with sync. Sync licensing has become kind of you know, the golden goose that we all look at because I think they pay credibly for music that you create. And it's one of the one of the few bastions in places where it does. So we're super excited to have Mallory of Maximal Sync and Brian Hall of former well, one of the co founders of Marmoset, but now he's 
he's just like y'all. He's creating music, but he really understands sync licensing, and he's able to bring a lot of those skills and um, experiences to the conversation. So you don't want to hear me talk anymore. Let's pull them up. I can't see a dang thing. Can we maybe turn the house lights or turn the stage lights a little bit off and yeah, so we can see folks? There'll be question time too. There they come. Hello. All right. Why don't you each kind of introduce yourselves? How did you how did you get here? Do you want to start? Oh, uh, sure. Can you guys hear me okay? Um, let's see here. I'm going to take it off the stand. Um, hi, everyone. Um, my name is Mallory Zumbach. I'm the founder of Maximal Music Sync, um, an independent sync rep company. Um, my career has had some twists and turns. Um, I went to the Berklee College of Music. I um, left there to intern for and then work at an independent record label in New York City called One Little Indian Records. Um, and then ended up switching over to the publishing side, which is where I first really sort of heavily got into sync at Warner Chapel. Um, I was in the New York office, so I did music for advertising and video games. I don't know why they paired video games with ads, but that was the way that it worked. And um, I was there for about four and a half years. Um, then I actually... Um, switched sides altogether and spent some time at CPB, an advertising agency in Colorado, um, most notably famous for inventing the Burger King King, I think. <laughs> that little creepy guy, you know? Um, and then, um, then I moved back to New York, spent some time at Round Hill Music, um, which was an independent publisher that was new at the time. I was kind of the first sync team member there. Um, and ultimately ended up out here um, and starting my own thing. Um, and I started Maximal. It's actually been five years as of February. So it's been pretty good. And um, that's sort of my story in a nutshell. But, you know, my background is um, I, although I don't currently sing, I majored in voice. I was a singer. Um, so I have a musical background, um, but also always sort of really loved soundtracks and stuff. And when I realized that there was a way to help other artists get their music into soundtracks, um, that really like grabbed me early on and kind of became a goal, so. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Hi, I'm Brian. Um, I am from Corvallis, which is an hour and a half south. I uh, grew up playing in bands. Um, in 2007, I moved here without knowing, I was like kind of a fledgling um, music producer. Like, like I had made a couple albums for my own projects. So I'd probably produced less than 20 songs. And um, I moved to Portland on a whim, well, but not on a whim after a lot of thought because like someone at a show told me that you could make money um, writing music for ads. And um, I was choosing between Nashville and LA and Portland. And my wife wanted to stay here because uh, we have family here. I got married really young. Um, so so we came to Portland, and I um, I started trying to teach myself how to produce, and it was a long, winding road. Mm -hmm. I was kind of more what you would call in, in the industry, like a composer, as my career started to develop. So people hired me to write music for picture. I fell in love with that that craft, and it was actually really hard. I've, I've since kind of evolved away from that, mostly because... Um, coked up advertising people that call you for for uh, f uh, for original music they they sometimes lack boundaries and are, are it's just crazy um, so I, and I wasn't good at saying no I didn't have good boundaries either I just said yes to everything and burned myself out so um, now I work on kind of my I, I know I have to produce music and finish it but I get to kind of I know what stage everything is at when it gets finished and I just build my own like catalog of music and then I have that represented for sync now so but between now and when I was a composer I um, I co-founded this company called Marmoset and that was as an extension basically what happened was um, I got I was lucky enough to get into the right rooms at, um, there's this local agency called White and Kennedy they're far from local um, but um, yeah, CPB did the Burger King, King, Wyden did like Nike Swoosh. They're, and they're 
probably, I mean, they're iconic culturally. They're one of the most culturally important ad agencies. And I just, like, was in, you remember the Old Spice stuff? Like, Tim and Eric started all that ridiculous Old Spice stuff. I was, like, in a boardroom. They were talking about a creative call they just had with Tim and Eric. Like, it was it was a surreal time. So I had the short stint at Wyden, worked on a couple big things, and they just kind of put me on the map. And, and then I met... Um, my friend Ryan, who was managing bands in Portland and trying to crack the code on how to create sustainable income for those bands, and he was like, "What about licensing?" And I was, and I kind of had at that point, I kind of had the secret handbook. I, but I just, am, I have ADD. Like, I'm not going to actually, like, I know how to make music. But so he became kind of the operating partner, and I was the creative partner. And I started building a talent pool of composers and producers. And we started relentlessly trying to find opportunities to create music for Sync. And that journey took me to about 2014, 2015. We were at like 20 or 30 people. And I was kind of staring into the void. Like, do I want to actually learn how to be a bureaucrat? Because um, I'm really bad. If I'm going to be honest with myself, I'm really bad at it. Um, or do I want to try to, like, keep being creative? And so I took a sabbatical and I... Got a, there's this local label, Badman Recording Company. I have a band with my wife called Tense. We put a couple of records out on that label and toured a little bit and had a family and the sabbatical kept getting longer. And then in early COVID, and I just I kept writing, like I was like a freelancer in my own company. So I kept writing music for ads to pay the bills. And then in 2020, I just sort of realized like, I wanna like, I, I love, I'm so thankful for what I did at Marmoset, but I just, I don't know, I, th I think it's time for me to move on. The thing that inspires you to start something crazy, um, whatever energies inside you are often the kinds of energies that will maybe make you resistant to just maintaining the status quo in your own life, I feel like. So um, So it's time for me to move on. So I moved on in 2020 and now I, I was hyper insular in my productivity, like as a result of timelines mostly, like you never have any time to, make, to, to collaborate when you're working in, in advertising for clients. And so I learned to just shut everyone else out. And so I've kind of been like repairing that part of my life. And also being, you know, like the basement artist, it's super precious. I'm sure there's, we could raise our hands. How many of you are very uncomfortable with collaboration? Raise your hand if you're very uncomfortable with collaboration. Yeah, and, and then there's the next question, which is how many of you are uncomfortable with collaborating with people you don't know very well? Yeah, so like I'm trying to just get to the point where I can just put myself in any room and just be at ease, you know, and that's a skill and it's hard and um, and that has really fueled me and reignited my career, writing music on my own that's not for sync, writing music for sync, and so really what drives me now is, is leaving this sort of um, claustrophobic digital creator, freelance creator hiding in their spare room or their garage or whatever and, and trying to invite people into that space and have more fun making things and share, hopefully share the equity of, uh, and the proceeds of what we make. So, Nice. Excellent. Um, so for each of you, and I'll ask a couple of questions of you about Marmoset. I don't know you, enough, you know enough about it to answer some things, but what I know you've got local artists, you've got artists from elsewhere. Talk a little bit about kind of how you build your stable um, and what it means between a signed artist and an indie artist. Yeah, sure, absolutely. Um, so I think for me, something that kind of became apparent to me over the course of my career that is like a guiding part of my principle when I think about how to build Maximal's catalog um, is that... Um, you know, in order, in order to draw music supervisors to you and get them to consistently reach out to you, <clears throat> you need a good mix of music. You need, you need artists from across a really wide range of genres. You need artists from different time periods. You need, you know, a really eclectic mix. Um, and especially, I think, these days, the briefs that we're seeing, um, like, on the TV front are getting more and more specific, where they're really focusing on the fact that, like... <laughs> This is a show where the main characters are all BIPOC and we want BIPOC artists because we want the music to feel very much authentic to the characters and the writing of the show and the show runner cares about that. Um, you know, or another good example is we get a lot of searches for like the L word and they 
definitely prefer to have artists who, you know, are from the queer spectrum. So we're always trying to think, you know, I'm always trying to think about how to diversify on that level, but also from a genre and sound, um, you know, level as well. And I think at the same time, I don't ever want to sign too many artists who all fit into sort of the same category because then your roster is competing with itself. So like when I was at Warner Chapel and we were a major and we had, you know, endless copyrights um, to work with, you know, we might have 15 or 20 bands that all had songs that were great for a brief, but the supervisor's telling us, send your top 10. And then you kind of have to kill your darlings, which I really hate. You know, as someone who loves music, it's like, oh no, I don't want to, I like, I want to pitch at least one song from everybody and I can't do it. And so I think um, when I, when I shifted from that major world back into the more independent world at Round Hill um, and then coming into my own company, um, a, a really nice aspect of that was getting to help sort of build rosters from the ground up and thinking about how, you know, we don't want to have so many artists that are competing with each other because then you're having to pit your own artists against each other. So that's a huge part of the process for me. It's that combination of making sure that I have like a diversity of things, a diversity of sounds, a diversity of artists, um, and then also making sure that um, I don't lean too heavy into any one particular sound so that all of a sudden I'm realizing that I've, my own roster is competing against itself. Um, so I, like, I always talk about that when I'm trying to sign an artist, like you will be a go-to for that sound because you're going to be one of, you know, three or four artists in that world. And so I think that that, um, that's pretty important. And like, you know, there are, there are, there are large publishers or large labels out there who, um, can offer you a big advance, right? But, you might get completely lost in their catalog. Um, and so I think that as an artist, you know, going, going somewhere that's smaller where you can stand out in that mix is pretty important. Um, but at the same time, obviously, as a pitch person, I want to have variety so that I can meet the supervisor's needs. Um, yeah, I mean, that's, that's, that's a really important part of it. I mean, as, as far as being based in this area, I would love to have more Pacific Northwest based artists, you know what I mean? And so I'm always kind of keeping an eye out for folks who are from Portland, from Seattle to try to build up that portion of my roster in particular. Um, I think that can be a nice thing, obviously, to have people that are based where you're based so that you're able to actually see their shows and stuff. You don't have to wait for them to tour through. Um, but, um, but at the same time, you know, I also sign artists, um, you know, I, for a long time I had a band who was from Iceland on my roster and it's just like, you, you do need a, a wide variety of things because you never know when you're going to get that project where they say, we need a band that's singing something in Icelandic, you know what I mean? Um, but yeah, I mean, I definitely, from a personal standpoint, um, it, it grabs my attention if somebody is from this area and I'm always trying to find more people who are from this area to work with um, since I know that there are not that many companies that are based here that's important to me yeah. and how, how many do you have on your roster now just count oh yeah. um, it's probably somewhere in the like 30 to 40 I mean I always kind of keep it there right so there's a little bit of a natural attrition because <laughs> sometimes people actually get offered a deal somewhere like at a publisher or a label and they get signed and <laughs> like I can't offer them in advance because I'm just a sync rep company so so, um, you know, they might leave um, and then I might try to fill that void with, with somebody else. But um, I, I try to keep it balanced somewhere in the like 30 to 40 artists side. Um, I also consult for a few larger companies um, that are publishers too, like Penn Music Group who are based in LA. And like, even when I'm signing stuff to my catalog, I'm thinking about like, Penn doesn't have anything like this, so I need to have something like this. Do you know what I mean? So, I mean, again, it's always just thinking about filling those holes and finding that balance. But yeah, I mean, I keep my roster pretty pretty tight. Nice. Brian, what about talking with your Marmoset hat on? Um, local versus? Yeah, I mean, the thing that I think might be a useful framework is there's kind of two buckets that we would always put uh, music into. One bucket was like, this is just music that exists in the wild that is um, circumstantially relevant to what the market wants. So artist X just fell in love with whatever type of music and started making it and got better and better at it. And their kind of um, peak coincided with advertising companies wanting to license, like like advertisers wanting to license that type of, type of music. And then scenario two is the type of person who's just uh, more of like um, a studied 
you know, a person who's studied sync and ha maybe can focus on multiple genres, or maybe they can't, maybe they're really good at one kind of thing, but they're obviously like a, um, a very focused, skilled person who studied the, the specific, specific market. So I feel like um, that's useful perspective because one of the hardest things was when people, when somebody got started making money and then they fell out of favor. Um, it was always really disappointing to them and they maybe um, started to feel like this was going to be their new normal and then things change and then it's really discouraging and they realize they have to either become a real student of, of sync or they have to kind of figure something else out. And then the inverse of that is also true. If you're somebody who's really focused and really, um, really developed a skill of creating a certain kind of music and you've been doing it maybe not as necessarily an artist but as someone who's trying to build a catalog and make money, it's really valuable to understand that that is a really meaningful path that certain people do take. And um, and that it's really, at that point, it's really about, if you're making something really special, this is such a key question, because it really is about getting it into the right hands. If you have the right people, sometimes there's really good music that just hasn't been exploited well. You know, it's just sitting somewhere. And the person that maybe is in charge of pitching it isn't isn't really giving it the opportunities or maybe doesn't have actually the opportunities coming to them to represent it well so you've talked about being a student of psych sync. oh of sync sync yeah. psych. psych is also another great psych thing is to that's a different first monday yeah. sign up um, um explain what you mean by a student of do you mean somebody that can compose to it or somebody that writes songs because i'm writing songs about cars because people like car songs and they pay for them I mean um, writing music for sync is a really um, I almost want to say like bizarre skill set uh, it's sort of like there's no up until you start creating the momentum of cash flow like until you start seeing your work make money that's the only real thing that you have to go on like oh this is the right thing now and on the way you might have had 10 different people tell you 10 different things and they all meant actually the same thing. You know, it's like you hear, like, don't write music for ads, it'll feel inauthentic, but then you're like, really? Like, what are all these people doing right now? Like, they're all writing music for, and that person's making a ton of money and I'm pretty sure they're writing music for ads. Like, so there's just so many bizarre, um, learning how to, I don't know, like one of the things is if you write like a really tasty guitar hook in the low mids and it's like a really important part of your arrangement, that could be cool, but the human voice is like in those kind of the A string of an electric guitar. Like, so you really got to, if you're going to put it there, it can't be very active and you've got to like really scoop the EQ so there's not too much resonance in the low mids or else or else that they're going to be like, this track is dope and it's going to make it to the edit and they're going to be like, we can't get the mix working. You know, like there's, a mi there's not a million things. There are a lot of things like that. And um, so being a student, I guess, would just be starting to stockpile insight about what people actually want specifically in this niche. Hmm. And how much of what is happening for either of you are pre-existing songs versus like maybe songs that were written as songs elsewhere that maybe catch the wave of some kind of cultural, you know, gestalt, but um, versus ones that are written, you know, intentionally for sync. Is there a time length? Like, you know, I got a tight one minute 15 and that's what's going to be more marketable or how, how does that work? Um, I mean, I think <clears throat> I would say that a marmoset model and a maximal model are somewhat different, right? So for me, the bulk of what I'm pitching, um, it's songs that exist, um, whether, whether they are songs that an artist has written f for release, songs that an artist wrote and has never released, but they don't, you know, they want me to pitch it, or um, occasionally songs where, like, one of my clients does a sync camp three times a year where we bring in music supervisors and people uh, write to the briefs and then we pitch those both to the briefs they were written for and other project for other projects um, but it's a lot that's a lot pre pre-existing music right and then like occasionally I will get searches where they are looking for somebody to demo an original song um, and that 
that process goes into a lot of what Brian was just talking about, and um, that is like a different skill set entirely. And you know, in that case, they may say, I mean, I once I once had an artist. This project did not go final because it was what their goal was ludicrous. It was impossible. So um, he was working for an ad um, for a certain brand of peanuts, and um, they wanted a uh, they wanted a crooner sounding vocal to do a cover of um, a PD Christmas song. I can't remember which one off the top of my head. And it needed to be for like a 15 second spot. <laughs> they had like written these parody lyrics. And he was really good. Like he had some experience doing film score and stuff like that. And um, he definitely had the skill set. But he, when he turned in the final demo to me, he was like, I had to like cut out all my breathing. So it sounds really unnatural because there was just no way to get that in there without it sounding like the chipmunks were singing it. Do you know what I mean? And like, you know, we went back and forth and, and like the, the company that we were working with, this company Walker that's in LA, they were like, it's really good. It's fine that he cut the vocals, out, you know, he, that he cut his breathing out, even though it doesn't sound quite right. Like this is good enough for a demo. <laughs> and then like, finally the client came back and was like, yeah, we're scrapping this whole idea because we realize it's impossible because of course the other two artists who also demoed for it had the exact same problem. But, um, so, you know, they will ask you, as you said, some really crazy things, and sometimes you're dealing with people who don't understand music, because, like, the music supervisor might understand music, the music producer on the project, but they're also having to answer to all these creative directors and, you know, the brand, and those people might have crazy asks that are just not possible. So I think that's always a good example of, like, how wild the sort of ask can get. And... Um, you know, I think um, in those cases, obviously, yes, that was like a very short. You're just you're just like writing it to the exact brief for the exact length of the spot. Um, but you know, anytime you're you're pitching um, pre-existing things, we're usually sending out the full song. Although we might have a note in there like "Start listening here for the key lyric that you want," or <clears throat> if you're looking for build, it's it's between here and there. And a lot of us use a pitch system called Disco that has the waveform in it. So I know a lot of supervisors will kind of skip to the point in the waveform where they can tell that the big dramatic build is happening if that's what they need. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's uh, to sort of like circle back for me. I think it's more pre-existing music. Um, and some creating for, you know, demoing or to brief. Um, whereas I would say Marmoset was maybe a, a more even blend of both. I mean, that's, you could speak to that. Um, I think Marmoset, yeah, we didn't do it. Actually doing client work is pretty, um, pretty minimal. And as far as I know, still there. I mean, it definitely happens, but the lion's share of, artists that are making sustainable income in music now are not working to brief and that I, they might be, you know, it might be it's some, there's a brief, whether it's in your head or whether someone gave it to you, but, um, not like on a deadline for a specific project. So like, um, and, and I, uh, um, I would say probably 99% of the sinks that I've had, and the money that I've made were either things I made for a client project and then pitched after the fact or applied some of the principles of like being a student of sync like it's in some way at some point everything though that I make is sort of meant to be um, it's a little ridiculous it feels like especially in certain genres that are really corny it feels a little ridiculous but you know I'll, I'll put stuff up on DistroKid um, everything's got a top line. For those of you who don't know what a top line is, it's just a melody and lyrics. So, it, like, a lot of producers make a lot of money just producing at scale. Um, and it's sort of like the worst the track you start using. It's like you start out in like Walmart territory, and then even but some people are really good. But they're that's that's kind of how their tracks are valued because they're cranking out quantity and then as the tracks get top lines then they start to be more like target and then as it, as the artists are actually um have brands and are active on social media and have followings then we get into like gucci and those are the ones that that get like big six-figure licenses so so should well, here's a question. So if you're seeing sort of a, a shift in 
the zeitgeist of what people are wanting. You know, it's like happy is in. It's got to be happy. You know, do you communicate that to your artists, or do you like you sort of grok that and it, does it change what you write? But do you follow the trends of potential demand? Absolutely. Um, so I keep uh, like um, a Google Doc where I have sort of the keywords lyrically for sync, like the themes that we just get requests for over and over again. And those kind of always stay the same, you know, like we need songs about togetherness and assurance because those work in, you know, Thanksgiving themed bank ads, but they also work in like happy scenes. And I mean, you're laughing, but like I definitely had an artist write a song to that and then pitched it and it, it, it like was like down to two for a Thanksgiving bank ad. But, um, you know, but that, like, I mean, that theme also comes up in like, you know, heartwarming moments in a TV show, right? So like there, there are those sort of universal lyrical needs and like everybody loves to write romantic love songs, but what we really need in sync is platonic love where it could be like a dad singing it to his son, you know what I mean? Um, that's like part of it when I'm when I'm talking to all the artists that I work with about sync, um, and then the like secondary part of that Google Doc is uh, talking about sort of um, reference tracks, and it's reference tracks that we see popping up like again and again, especially if they start popping up across different media types. So like when Lizzo's album got big, not the current one, but the previous one, when that album started to blow up, we were seeing requests for songs of hers, for ads, for TV, for promos, for trailers. It was like all over the map, do you know what I mean? And it was like, definitely, if you can write some like, badass female empowerment music, um, you know, with like, hip hop elements and like cool danceable beats, like that is gonna be a thing that will be very useful to sync. And so I, you know, I kind of put together that list, but then obviously I know that not every artist on my roster can or has the will to do, to do that, right? So part of it is about saying, here's sort of what's trending, here are sort of the evergreen sounds that always come up again and again, here are maybe a few things to avoid, like, uh, you know, 10 years ago everybody loved a hand clap and a whistle and a foot stomp, and like, then, of course, as with all, all, all good things must come to an end, right? So, like, people got real hand-clapped and whistling out. They were like, no, please no. And so, um, and all of a sudden, we started to see briefs where, seriously, people would be like, just no hand-claps. No whistling, no ukulele, you know what I mean? And you're like, oh, okay, like that. And, uh, you know, the trend has passed, and then they'll be moving into something else. I mean, right now... I think trends, definitely um, really soulful vocals. That seems to be something that comes up across the board. I was just pitching on a TV show. Um, I can't say the name of it because it's a new, a new TV show, so I don't want to like, blow their cover for their plans for the music yet. But um, you know, we were pitching on, on a pilot of something, and they've been coming to us for the full season searches, and like everything needs to be soulful vocals, but, but across multiple kinds of genres, right? Um, so that can be actual indie soul, but it could be singer-songwriter stuff that just has a, that aspect to the vocals, right? And so I think that we've been seeing in ads, in TV, uh, across a lot of different um, media, and that's kind of how I always know that it's a real trend. Because um, you have your sort of like trends in advertising, and like advertising often uses a different sound from what trailers use, from what promo, and like trailers is a weird world unto itself that we can definitely get into in a minute. Like even the people who work in trailers are like a weird world unto themselves. Like I love them, but they don't come out into the light. You know what I mean? Um, so I think, you know what I'm saying? Like they, they really don't. So, um, so I think that's why they love all that epic music. Um, but, uh, you know, so you know, like some areas always kind of have their, their sound and that's their sound. But like, yes, we definitely notice those trends and I always try to communicate them to my artists. And like, that's why I put it in that Google Doc because I was like, I'll update it. And, you know, if you, if you are going back into the studio to write or you're thinking, I want to try to write some stuff with sync in mind, like it, there it is. And like, hopefully it has those sort of, you know, the, the most current trends because we are... When we get those briefs, we're, we're aware of the trends maybe even before the supervisors are. Do you know what I mean? Because they don't know that so-and-so at that other agency also reached out looking for a similar thing or referencing that same song. It's kind of funny to see how things bubble up here and there. Um, What's the weirdest convergence you've ever noticed? I mean, I think the weirdest convergence was all of a sudden we started getting a bunch of requests for stuff in foreign languages like two years ago. And that was like, whoa, what is this about? And that was a TV thing. Um, there was a week where we got like three searches 
for um, authentic, like, vintage, like, Vietnamese and Thai music. And that was just really mind-blowing that, like, whoa. And they were working on completely different projects. So I don't know what was in the air at the moment, but... Um, you know, every once in a while, um, something really strange like that will happen where you're just like, okay, everybody set an episode of their show in Thailand this this year, you know what I mean? Um, and suddenly needed that music. So, um, you know, that definitely happens. But I mean, I will also say, like, a Lizzo moment, when that happened a few years ago, that was a big moment. Um, you know, a song that, and there are some songs that just get referenced all the time. When I first started out, um, you know, Blur, song number two, like that song got referenced all the time. I mean, to the point where we would joke about it a lot at Warner. And then like, I feel like not too long ago, it was in a car commercial again. So like they, they come back, you know what I'm saying? That's the other thing. Like they, they are cyclical. I feel like we're getting more rock requests lately. That went by the wayside for a long time. So, um, you know, sometimes as you were saying, sometimes it's hard because you have an artist who really lives in that world naturally. And they're like, blowing up on the sink front and then they release a new record and suddenly that's not the sound anymore and like that's a hard that's like a hard conversation to have with an artist but also a little patience you know and you never know there are still when you're working across all the different media types there are still projects that buck the trends right so that's the other thing like you never know when a search is going to come in and because a character loves this kind of music all of a sudden they have to have that kind of music for their project which is a nice a nice thing about hello kate bush yeah yeah, yeah i mean they act like they invented her right i was like <laughs> i i love it I, I love kate bush i love kate bush to death i frankly felt like justice for palm springs that movie with um the guy from reno not not reno 911 um the guy from brooklyn nine nine because <laughs> They used a Kate Bush song really well at the end of that movie, and it just didn't blow up in the way that Stranger Things did, but heck yeah, like bring Kate Bush back, you know what I mean? Exactly. What about yourself? Do you, how do you sort of track themes for your own work or for other people? Yeah, you know, I think um, it's such like, like I, I, this is like a very important question, I would say, to anyone who's trying to get into sync. Um, and to me, the way I would contextualize it is, I would call the, the research and study of what's trending um, is maybe what you would call pre-production. And it's the foundation for everything. And while you can't be like fatalistic about something, a project you set out, you know, like part of it for me is I tend to try to make things in batches. So if I'm gonna make one song in a genre, I try to, to plan on making more because I don't want um, the gatekeepers, like say I'm, say we're working together, I don't want her to have one track of mine in some genre because she's just not gonna probably remember it as well as if I just keep sending her stuff in the same genre. So um, so the pre-production is like the foundation of, of and it's, sometimes it's so important, especially when you're starting, you're throwing noodles, you have to be willing to just fail. But that said, um, pre-production is like, everything like you have to know obviously how to do the things that come after it but it's the beginning and if you get it wrong you might learn you will learn but it, the more time that you spend on it the more likely the more you're like sync is like um it's like a it's like a puzzle it's like it's like um you you have to look for the conversions like everyone in this room regardless of your genre you have some style of music that's making money that's one or two ticks away from what your like natural instinct is um so like y you know the, the the really intelligent thing to do would be to look for that like convergence of the market and what you like and what you're good at and then it would be to like study what kind of lyrics seem to be relevant in the specific genre you're in and like what the production tropes are what kind of sounds are being made and how can you how can you figure out how to get those sounds made if you're a producer and um, th and as you start to build, I have hundreds of Spotify playlists that I've abandoned and gone. Oh shit! Like, where is that reference track? Um, like, like so so. And I would say I would say um, there's two ways that you can get um, really good pre-production. One is by finding a collaborator that's just better than you that has, is making money, knows how to make money and just writing their coattails and figuring out how to help make their, figuring out how to bring value in your own way to what they're doing. And the other way is as you start building relationships with gatekeepers, with sync reps, is um, to figure out at almost any cost how to get them to like you enough and value you enough 
to tell you like what's popping off. So, and there's a couple ways that can happen. One is just through relationship naturally. Another way is exclusivity. Um, like exclusivity is a really, it's a complicated to topic, um, but it's an important one. And I, I would say in a heartbeat, if I was new and somebody cared about me enough to give me any information about what to make and help maybe give me feedback on it. And if, if there was a trade for exclusivity there, that's a very good trade in my mind. If the person's truly like a legitimate professional that has insight. Um, so, and so I now, because I'm not at Marmot, like when I was at Marmot set, it was so easy because I could just see everything that was licensing. I could see every brief. It was like, I actually didn't, I don't think I realized how good of a position I was in. Um, I just knew like, and you know, they do a lot of revenue. So like, I really saw a big cross section and I could easily, quickly make super, super well, um, I had a lot of like metrics, which you hate to think about making music that way, but they could tell me, okay, this is how I need to pivot this project, or I can make some new tracks over here, but they kind of have to do this differently, or I'm going to start a new project in this style, and oh, I suck at this style, but if I bring in this person now, like, I'm super good at it, magically. <laughs> so, like, um, yeah, so, like, it's, it's, but now I, I give, I have executive producers, people like Mallory, who, who I'll just give them points on songs that I make, and all they have to do is give me reference tracks and lyrical direction, which is like kind of maybe, I don't know how common that is. I was like getting so frustrated because I felt like, I, I was like, I don't know if I'm doing good enough pre-production. Like I feel like I, I just want to know. Like I want to know that what I'm making is a good decision. And so I give away like 10% of a track to somebody. I have a friend in LA who will just tell me what she's getting. There you go. So, so when, when, does everybody understand what he means by pre-production? Or does, does anybody want more detail on that? Yes, there's nodding heads. What do you mean by pre-production? Oh, uh, just um, pre-production would be everything you do before you start writing, start putting the pen to paper in any way. So for me, there's, um, I mean, you can chime in on this. There's uh, lyrics, lyrics, um, reference tracks, um, and generally activating your imagination toward a new target, like figuring out what the target is. You know, I will, a, a lot of really, you know, there's a lot of really weird stuff that happens in, not just at, not just sync, but all across the commercial music industry too. Where you'll just hear, oh, this person's referencing this track and this beats from, it's like, oh, this is the Jay-Z beat. And the, you know, like, it's like crazy, the stuff you just pick up and um, for me, the way I combat that, this idea of like, oh wow, like I don't want to just copy other people, is I'll, I'll, look, I'll look to build a really compelling batch of like five to ten songs that are like all relevant to a certain, and then I'll pick two or three of them at a time. I'll be like, okay, I'm going to write a song that kind of feels like this, like these ones, and I'll never allow myself to. I, sometimes it's really hard. If you like laser focus one reference track, you'll just go crazy, like, uh, because, especially as a producer, because it's so hard to do something original when all you're trying to do is capture, like, so I'll always, the way you avoid that is just by, you just keep getting new references into your brain. You, like, wash your brain out with new references. You, it's like learning how to manipulate your creative uh, vitality is, like, such a big part of writing for sync. So, so really... It's an pre-production kind of happens along the way, but really it's just about making very informed decisions about what you're going to make. Yeah, it's funny. That's a really good point too about not just relying on one reference track. So like, if I call out a reference track, then I list like three or four other songs that are also good examples of what it is that supervisors gravitate toward. And I also try to kind of point out to my artists like, these are the reasons why they love these tracks, right? It's because there is a lot of build because the intro is very different from the verse, it's very different from the chorus, which gives an editor a lot of points to play around with. Um, so much of writing for sync is like thinking about how to make editors happy, which is not how people normally write songs, right? But like editors want a lot of quick little builds and like ear candy in the production and all of these things that they can like line up to picture in a way that elevates that picture, right? And so, um, you know, if I'm saying, well, everybody really loves, like, still to this day, like, DJ Shadow and Run the Jewels, that song, um, 
I'm blanking on the title, but somebody giggled because they know it. Um, and it's because it like sounds like it has a sample in it, but it doesn't have a sample because that would be a clearance problem. Like when you're creating it, you need to make it not have a sample. You need to make it sound like it has a sample in it, right? And so like there's like there are things like that that I try to point out and then like give three or four different examples of songs that do that because not only can listening to just one reference track get you in trouble creatively, it can actually get you in trouble from a legal perspective because you might accidentally rip that off. So always try to give yourself, you know, a lot of, a lot of reference points. And, um, you know, to further that, like, if I have a writer who's telling me I want to write more stuff with sync in mind, then I make sure that they know to, like, send it to me before it's done and let's talk about what changes might make sense and like lift it up um, to where it becomes more syncable, you know, or even if you're working on it and you're just thinking, oh, should I add strings to this or is that too much? Like let somebody who actually is going to be pitching it kind of give you a little bit more input on it because they might have some ideas. They might say, no, like this song doesn't need strings. That's not what it's right for. Or, you know what? I would love to have a version with strings or maybe a remix that's like trailerized sounding, which is like a whole, again, a whole conversation. Trailers. Trailers. Um, Tra yeah. trailers, trailers are weird. Trailers are weird. They're I, really weird. I'm I've not like. Met some. some have come to First Monday and mm -hmm. they'll be sitting over in the corner and, you know, <laughs> and, and, because I just go up to people and I'll talk and they're very, like, slow to tell you what they do. <laughs> And then they explain that they do trailers. I said, oh, so soundtracks for movies. No, trailers. trailers. Way you, different. You it's can't way different. use the same music from the movie in the trailer, but it has to be exciting enough and apt enough to get somebody. It's like, and, and they sit in there. Th it's amazing work. It's, it's just It's a whole incredible. wild world. Well, even like oftentimes on a trailer, multiple trailer houses are pitching for a trailer like to the studio which means that like your song might be getting pitched to one supervisor who reaches out to me and then like maybe another supervisor reaches out to him and like the, another song's getting pitched but then like the, even if your song gets like picked for this version of the trailer that trailer might not actually ever like see the light of day it's like it's so it's such its own thing but because of that it's very urgent and they really don't ever leave work like they just live at yeah, work it's, they, they do all the time yeah. um, games gaming is big here it's mm -hmm. huge it's huge across the country and it's increasingly something that is buying music how do you guys work with gaming well i mean it's it's um it's changed a lot since i first started out so when i first started out that was in the heyday of like the rock bands and the guitar heroes and they were licensing so much music and like i worked at warner chapel we had Led Zeppelin. They were always trying to do like a Led Zeppelin guitar hero. We had Van Halen, and we worked with them on that project, and it was really crazy. And um, and like that was a real heyday for for game music in that um, the fee structure was very different. So if you just have like a song in a Grand Theft Auto, they sort of like pay you a flat fee for that use, um, which is kind of similar to like how TV TV is, right? Um, but like if you have a song in a music based game where the music is actually integral to play, you get paid in advance on so many units being sold and then you get paid a royalty after that. So um, that, was, that was like a wild time to be doing video game music. Um, and like the first game I ever worked on was Bioshock that used all these old standards and none of those people uh, on those catalogs had any idea how, how, what, what video game licensing was. So I really got to learn every little like nitty gritty detail of how to get a, someone to approve a use like that because I had to explain everything as if I was an expert because it was a lot of these like lawyers who you know were first dates of people who had never seen a video game license before because who put Billie Holiday in a video game prior to that, you know what yeah. I mean? So. Um, so there was, I mean, that was a really wild time and I feel like we got a lot of searches and over the years, like things have shifted in certain ways and, you know, a lot of the major video game companies have in-house people, but then there's also all of these like independent companies um, that sometimes work with supervisors. Um, so, you know, there are a, a lot of searches come through, but at the same time also there's a lot of in-house composers who work on those projects too. And then like, again, some of the gaming companies do their own sort of promo trailers for the games, and then other companies don't and use outside trailer houses to do those, those trailers and stuff. So uh, you're, again, you're pitching on two levels because you're pitching for those in-game uses, but you're also pitching for the trailer promo side of it, which is a whole other ballgame. So this is all talking about 
say, you know, I'm an artist, I'm in your stable, and I have clearly lots of benefits. I'm an artist with a network of people that I already know and have worked with and I've got my own kind of thing going on. Say you are a, an artist and you have something that really takes off on Spotify or TikTok, it's what the kids are doing, right? <laughs> um, you know, it's like, it, like, what are other channels that are effective and what are other channels that are just a waste of time? Um, outside of like Spotify and I mean, I think it, as far as sync goes, what's effective? So, yeah, just uh, having your sound, you know, you create a sound and particularly if you're doing it with sync in mind, mm -hmm. um, what are other channels besides having representation that can get you in front of a supervisor? Ooh, I mean, you're asking our rep that question. So do you want to take it? I mean, so you could get really hella famous. <laughs> um, then they start coming to you. That's I hear that's crazy. Yes, right? Yes. Um, take notes. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's definitely true, even up to a point that people that get really are really disciplined um, in that way create a lot more opportunities for themselves, even well before they become, um, you know, super duper famous. But that's one. Um, in general. You know, there's a lot, especially in the city, there's a lot, you're like, so I, I cut my teeth, we're talking about video games, I cut my teeth um, as a composer, cold, it was before, it was back when there were still Flash browser games really being actively built, and I would like cold, um, I would cold email like, like game devs that were making Flash games, and be like, hey, I'll make music, I'll make loops for your Flash game, and um it was crazy because, so in that industry, if a game did well, it was all these like 13 to 22 year old kids, and some of them like ran the dev, that were like developing games for Flash, and they were all these kind of obsessive cult, it was this cult scene, and like if they made, they made me work for hire for like 300 bucks, so I, basically that meant they bought out all my rights for these loops that I made for their games for 300 bucks. I was green, like I learned, I, I was happy, to, I was actually, for a while it became not a good thing to do, but um, for, for a good period of time it was like, yeah, I'll do it for 300 bucks. Um, but they, they, they worked for hired you because if they didn't, like kids would figure out how to rip the audio and then they would put more games and more audio and it turned into this whole like, I guess like shit show of like just the same digit, like super low bit rate MP3 flying around. So anyways, that's just a side, I'm sorry, that was a side tangent. Um, but there's a, there's a lot, I mean, you're an entrepreneur at some point. So there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of ways you can access the industry. Your friend might work at an agency. Uh, you should talk to them once you're ready. Um, like there's a, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of unlikely, you know, like I, I had a friend who was in a famous band and was a stay-at-home dad, and you had Charlie Campbell from Pond. He's got like an active thing now, but there were periods where he would, um, he kind of knew for a period of time that he was going to get like one huge, huge six-figure job from this like group of people that he was really close to that loved his music from before that worked at Wyatt in Portland. So he's a Portland guy. And he would like just every now and then, like he would get these opportunities to work on these huge budgets. And um, so you just don't, I mean, it's, it's definitely a good, it's a good thought, like how else can I make money? And the, the ways that we are kind of talking about where you go find a sync rep and you get your music representation and all that, these are definitely the roads more traveled. But the nice thing about them is that they can scale somewhat predictably if you get good at it. Whereas some of the other stuff is a little bit more wild card, you know, um, or requires a greater degree of entrepreneurial um, go get them. Stick to, it's like requires way more business, business, business versus just focusing on being like I. I did the business thing, and I I stepped back from it, and I still have infrastructure and people around me to support me, and I have maybe more than like a normal sole proprietor would. But I, I have stepped away from that. I rely on people like Mallory to represent my music in the marketplace because I don't want to, 
it's worth it to me to share the the the, the cut if it's a ten thousand dollar cut and I have to give away half of it or thirty percent of it or whatever it is like I'm kind of all right with that because I don't have to run a business you know running a business is a pain um, so yeah I agree with that I mean I think. To, to sort of build off what you're saying, there are ways that you as a songwriter or artist can can make some connections with supervisors. Like, you can sign up to participate in songwriting camps type things where you're writing stuff for sync and maybe some supervisors attend that and you get to connect with them. But that's a, obviously, you're meeting a few supervisors at a time. Like, it's a little bit of a slower build up. You really have to sort of have that entrepreneurial uh, sort of spirit, as you're saying, to kind of chip away at it. You can you can go to the occasional conference or a, an event. You know what I mean? See see people speak like us today, and obviously now like you know us, right? So that's that is a way when you're first starting out and don't have representation to either find representation or connect with some supervisors. But that said, I think it's really important to sort of understand just how much music gets sent to supervisors every day. Like I know I get artists reaching out to me every day wanting me to rep them and I cannot possibly as one person like comb through all of that that music right so I have to really rely on people referring people to me or people that I meet at events like this um, where it, it, there's more of a connection as opposed to just a random email right but like for supervisors when they send out a brief, they're not just reaching out to me. They're reaching out to almost all the major publishers, all the major labels, most of the big indies, several other supervision companies like myself, Marmoset, et cetera, et cetera. And um, you know, there's even a few other people in this room who I know, friends, friends that are on my same side that work at other companies that do sync rep. And so, like, raise your hands. Yeah, where are you back there? Yeah. Good. They're watching my purse, so they go still go be talk there. to them too yeah. afterwards. <laughs> yeah, go talk to them. They are wonderful people. Um, they haven't heckled us yet. I know they want to though. But um, so you know, they're they're reaching out to all of us. And then if we're all sending them 10 or 15 songs, that's a lot of music to go through for one search. And if it's like a beginning of a TV season where they're like, send us you know 30 or 40 songs, that's even more. So, and we already have a relationship that gets us to that point. So if they're doing all that listening and you're an artist who's just sort of blindly reaching out to them, being like, hey, I love this show and I know my music is really good for it. Odds are not great they're going to get around to listening to it. Or if they do, it may be well beyond when it would have like helped you out. Do you know what I mean? And so that is why, you know, as Brian was saying, like the reps, we're here, sync rep companies, publishers, labels, we're all here to help you cut through that noise. Um, you know, and I know that I am like a stepping stone on the way to a publishing deal or a label deal, unless... Like, I have some legacy artists who don't want anything to do with that anymore. They want to rep all their stuff on their own, and so I am part of helping them stay independent, right? Um, <clears throat> like, I work with a woman whose name is Candy Staten, and she is slowly clawing all of her recordings back from Warner as they revert, and, like, she doesn't want to go back inside of another label right now. She just wants to manage her own recordings and have me pitch for sync, and that gives her, like, what she needs to, to get what she needs, right? So um, I think that, like... You know, the, that sort of, we are here to sort of help people at the beginning, and then we're also here to help them if they don't want to, to pursue a traditional sort of label publishing model if they want to keep it all independent, but they still, you know, it's just sync is one of those things that's hard to break through. It's kind of, it is different from, but similar to like PR. Like at a certain point, it really helps to have a PR person because how could you possibly know somebody at every single publication? How could you even like keep track of which blogs are the blogs people actually read? Do people even read blogs anymore? Like, I don't know, because I don't do PR, right? So if I needed help with PR, I would not be able to do it myself. I would turn to a friend. I feel like that's, Sync is similar. It's so, there's so much that you have to know and making the connections to people, the relationships aspect of it is really important, so. I would add to that briefly. Um, if you, you certainly are not going to get uh, much headway without having infrastructure to some of these like more traveled roads, which is where a lot of this stuff goes. If there's any chance, it's like with your friend who's an editor mm -hmm. or your friend who's a copywriter that works on a creative team. Um, like there's people that are making music choices at much smaller scales. And while those, like, that's kind of what we're talking about. Like, if there's any chance of you building 
and having something, some value to offer. It's with somebody who just kind of likes you that's sitting in one of those roles where they are buying music, but just not very much. Yeah, if you have a friend who's an editor, they're your best friend now. Like, <laughs> they are the ones who put in the Radiohead song that Radiohead won't approve, and then we have to replace it. Do you know what I mean? But then we're up against that temp track love. So, like, they're putting that in sometimes before a search has even been performed. Um, it's really nice to know editors and get your songs in front of editors so that is very wise yeah, we, I've, I've been working with a group called think northwest that used to be the portland advertising federation which is the oldest advertising federation in the united states but for about 60 years it's been a white man's drinking club <laughs> and <laughs> it like recently everything. was taken over by some younger Minds and Hearts and um, rebranded Think Northwest. It's dealing with both Seattle and um, Portland, all sort of Pacific Northwest agencies. And they have events. And, you know, to the degree that, like, relationships matter, not that you want to accost these people and say, hey, listen to this, but get involved. Like, if you're interested in this, get involved in that organization. Like Music Portland, they need volunteers at their events, you know? I went to a golf thing. It was really weird. But, um, you know, but but the the other thing is that, you know, I, I, with others, founded Music Portland with this ridiculous idea that we could do it differently, you know, that we could come together and we could actually change the trajectory of independent music in Portland. And because I am irrepressibly positive about stuff, um, one of the things that's happening with Music Portland is we are building a very interesting and exciting strategic partnership with the business community. And the other thing, you know, in Canada, there is a rule that if you're doing a Canadian television show, you have to use Canadian artists. Mm -hmm. You do. One of the things that we're looking at are ways of actually incentivizing Portland companies for whom Portland is a brand to actually stand together with Portland music in their promotions, in their commercials, in their corporate films, in all of this stuff to really start to make that cultural connection and be proud of what we have here because they've been making bank on Portland music for years and they've never had to do anything to pay into it. We're changing that. But I also like the idea of changing some of the kind of impulses so that they're, they're talking to, you know, they're talking to Mallory, they're looking for local artists and that changes the demand story for, for Mallory mm -hmm. and for other, for other reps because suddenly they want to know about more Portland artists because you're going to be in more demand. So my idea is that we keep building demand streams and, um, and everybody stays creative and keep coming to events because that's where you meet people um, and that's where you find opportunities. Um, we are going to now give some time for questions. We've got you know, about 20 minutes, 25 minutes or so for questions. And TJ is right up in front. Hey, you want to do this? Sure. So we get it on. Hi. <laughs> I'm TJ. I'm a drummer uh, around town. I moved here about a year and a half ago. I play in an instrumental progressive post-rock band. Uh, I used to play in a band called This Patch of Sky, which did like a ton of licensing deals for McDonald's. They scored a Russell Brand film. And I have no idea how any of that happened because their management did all of that. They put them in an editorial playlist, et cetera, et cetera. So I've been playing with my band for about seven years now, and we have like a decent catalog of music. So I'm kind of wondering um, how to go about developing a blueprint of what I would need to do to prepare our catalog to be ready for sync. You also mentioned some ways to develop relationships with people in MKS. I'm kind of curious. It seems like the best way to do that is meeting people in person. I feel like for me, when I develop relationships, they're friendships. They're not just like, I'm going to go network and schmooze with this person because they're a sync licensing person. So it's kind of new for me to come into an event like this and meet some people. So I guess I'm also curious, what, what, how do you think is like the most genuine way to like strike up a conversation where it doesn't feel like, hey, how can I leech from you and <laughs> not add value and you know build a relationship with people? So yeah, thank you. Well, networking is weird. Um, I think asking smart questions <laughs> at a panel can be a good way to get people's attention. Um, I am going to, yeah, no, no, I mean, it, it is, um, I'm going to tackle a little bit about your question, the part of your question where you were talking about prepping it, like, for a catalog. 
So some of this goes actually to the same stuff that Brian was talking about earlier, about sort of like doing your research before you start writing, right? Um, I think it's good to go back and revisit your songs and actually think about which ones really make sense for sync. Um, and whether that's like, I have been watching some show and I know that in that show they use a lot of similar music. Um, maybe I even went and like, went on to TuneFind and like researched what songs were in several of the episodes. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Um, I think which TuneFind is a great resource, by the way. I use that when supervisors send out searches for shows that I have not been able to watch because it's peak TV and there's way too much out there. And they don't like give very many details when they're like, oh, it's season two. It's the same kind of stuff as we used in season one. And you're like, that's the brief. Um, I like will go to TuneFind. So like people on my end are even using that, that website to sort of get familiar with what all is getting used in shows. It's also interesting because you can sometimes see what things are coming from made for sync catalogs, like, you know, APM or whatever, versus songs that are released by artists who are releasing them, you know, that, um, for their artist projects. So um, that's a good, a good thing to do. I think kind of identify what songs in your catalog feel like they're the most sync friendly because if you're reaching out to someone trying to get repped, I'm not gonna want to have to like sim swim through like a sea of songs, right? I want you to kind of put your best foot forward and like songs that you have released as singles might not really be the songs that are your sync songs. Do you know what I mean? So I think, I mean, this goes back to when I was in like high school band and my band director was like, so much of learning how to play an instrument is listening, right? It's listening to other people. That's like such a huge part of creating music is listening and listening and figuring out what you want to take from other sounds, what, you know, what inspires you. It's the same thing with sync. It's listening and really tuning in and paying attention. Don't walk away during the commercial break on, I guess, Hulu. Right, that's like the only place where I still see ads and it's the same two ads all, all show long. But like, you know, pay attention to what they're using because that will help guide you. And then you'll think, you know, I have a song in my catalog that has great lyrics about that topic that's like got a similar vibe and like that might be like my sync song. So you wanna try to identify what's great and send it to me. You also really need to have your shit together. <laughs> so, um, you know, this is, like, there's the whole creative aspect of sync pitching, right? But then there is also the whole business back end of licensing. And, like, when you, when I start working with an artist, I'm like, man, your song schedule, that's going to be, like, the most important thing you turn into me aside from audio, right? So you're going to get me all your music. I want your instrumentals along with your uh, normal versions of songs. I want any other versions, acoustic versions that you've done, remixes. I want all that audio like organized, properly labeled. I want to know the names of all the writers on those songs. I want to know the splits that they each get. I want to know if everybody that's on that track is part of our deal or if some of those people are published by other publishers, repped by other sync reps and need to be carved out because a huge phenomena in sync is whether or not you have stuff, what they call one stop, which is where you, I as the rep, represent 100% of the publishing and 100% of the sound recording, right? Um, but there, there are lots of one stop artists, mostly in the indie world. That's one of the advantages that indie people tend to have. Um, but the flip side of that is that there are also lots of things where songs are not one stop. And we, need to make it super clear when we're pitching stuff, like what rights we control, if there's any other companies in the mix that we'll have to be reached out to to clear things, et cetera, et cetera. So like, it's really incumbent upon you to be super organized. You also have to warn us if you sample anything, you have to. Um, yes. is, there, is there a system that people use effectively to catalog all that information to make it presentable? Well, so I, I mean, if artists were turning it into me and they don't know what a song schedule looks like, I have like a Google spreadsheet that I can like, who has examples and I send it to you and it has everything that I want because I also want to know some weird things <laughs> like is your recording a union recording or a non-union recording that means do any of the vocalists have a SAG after card or are any of the you know musicians AFM like that's not necessarily as big of an issue here in Portland but in other places like LA that might be a huge issue <laughs> so um and that affects things um he, that, that affects things hugely about our ability to pitch because a lot of ads need things to be non-union, unfortunately. I have a lot of feelings about that, by the way, but um, it is that is the world that we're in. So, um, you know, I will ask you all kinds of weird details about that, and you need to include that in the schedule for every single song so that I know what's going on. So you really have to get that information organized, and I know it's like a massive pain, and I want you to send me your lyrics if you have them for all of your songs because in my pitch system... 
that I send stuff to supervisors in, um, which is a system called Disco, and I don't know if you could hear us like yammering on about it back there earlier before before we came up on stage, but like Disco has become very popular. A lot of sync rep companies use it, um, but also a lot of supervisors use it on their end. So you send stuff really easily, system you know business to business um, that way, and the tagging on my end comes through on their end, and there is a section where you can put the lyrics in. I can search by lyrics, which is really important in sync because we get a lot of requests where they specify what lyrics they need, and then like. You know, the supervisors might also need to see those lyrics. I mean, to go back to video gaming, if a game is rated E for everyone, there can't be any explicit lyrics in the song. Um, so they need to see they need to see those lyrics written out to double check it. Um, which reminds me also, if you write explicit songs and you want them pitched for sync, we also need clean lyric versions. <laughs> That's not just like muting out the bad word. You've got to like create a version with a substitute lyric, and the best example of this is Fuck You by CeeLo. <laughs> we published that song when I was at Warner Chapel, and we licensed it so much because he created the version that was Forget You, otherwise we would have been able to do nothing with it. I mean, nowadays, there are, you know, certain TV shows or films that definitely will request explicit lyrics, like Bel Air is a good example of that. They often want the explicit version, but like, just as many of those, sh those shows that do that, there's also children's programming and PG movies that need it to be clean, you know what I mean? So, um, yeah, I mean, I could go on and on, but basically, get it all organized, because your pitch person's going to ask for it, and the more that you can arm us with, the better we can, you know what I mean? Like, I, I can feel more comfortable if you have turned in your splits and told me what PRO you're with on the publishing side, pitching it, because then I know if they need to turn a clearance around in 24 hours, we're golden, we have the information. You should also have your um, stems. You don't necessarily need to send them to me, but you need to have them where, you know, when I get the call that we want to use this song and we need the stems, like, within the next two hours, like, you can get them to me within two hours. You know What's what I mean? What's a stem? Yeah. Do you want to take those? A stem. <laughs> um, stems are um, kind of groupings of like tracks. Uh, so maybe all your drums on one stem, all your percussion on one stem, your bass on a stem, your keys on a stem, guitars on a stem, strings, keyboards, lead vocals, backing vocals, something like that. And they're generally um, supposed to be as loud as the, when played together, as the master or close. And um, the process goes Especially, I don't know, there's certain, there's certain um, types of media that is more common than others, but a lot of times they want, they have got some fancy person in an audio post-production facility that, has, um, that will mix, and they don't, their, their um, mandate is not to mess with your song, it's to have that, when they have that extra granularity, they're able to carve out space more meaningfully for the voiceover, for the sound effects, and they're able to make edits where maybe... Um, there's a cymbal crash in the drum stripe, but if they, you know, they can do things to sort of like make transitions, because if they take a three minute song, and they take the verse, and then they like the pre-chorus, the second pre-chorus, and they go to the bridge, and then, like all these edits they make are, can be really unpleasant sounding, and, and if they have the stems they can kind of smooth all that out. Other questions? Do you, do you want question. speak loudly so Stephen can hear you? So, like, in terms of stems, um, like, could you also get away with, like, say, having, like, three stems? Like, say, your drums, your melody, and then, like, your vocals. Like, all of them. Will that fly, or would you need to have all of them just, like, super stems? The, the more broken out, the better. Okay. But it also depends on the project. So, um, sometimes, sometimes if I go to an artist, like, I get a request, we need the stems. And then I go to the artist and say, hey, can you get me the stems? They'll be like, oh, like, my guy needs to, like, break them out. What do you need? And then, like, they can usually say, well, we just kind of need the basics, like, bass, drums, vocals, um, you know, guitar. And that's it. Like, well, they don't need it to be crazy. Um, so it kind of depends on the project. But I would say the more broken out, the more they can play with, the better. Because, again, it goes all the way back to that comment earlier about editors and how they're your best friend. But also maybe your worst enemy. Because they might really want to, like make a tweak and then get frustrated if they can't do it and then decide, you know what, the song doesn't work in that spot. So, um, I mean, we've seen, I've seen uses killed in the edit and it's just such a bummer. So, um, you know, the more you can do, the better within reason. Yeah. 
if that makes sense. Excellent. I, w I would say five or six stems is your minimum. And then, unless it's like a Green Day song, then. <laughs> um, but then, but then I tend to do more granularity for myself for posterity for me, because if I ever want to, if a track does really well, I might want to make versions of it, and I want to delete the session. I don't ever want to think about it again because I have ADD, <laughs> and, and I it's just over. You know, I'll come back to it four years later and be like so sad. So I, you know. <laughs> All right, who else? In the back, okay, right there? Yep. Um, I was curious for, uh, first of all, for like films, how is that different from uh, some of these other ones in terms of music? And specifically, when you have artists that are like, uh, you know, they're, they're used to playing for the stage and playing for listeners on Spotify, um, what is your advice for them to get into the sync world? What percentage of the artists that you have aren't like, at home, writing for sync all the time, that they have a, a flourishing career on the stage? Oh, most of my artists are not necessarily writing for sync. I mean, some of them might come to me and say, I'm interested in also doing that in addition to my artist project, but almost everybody I sign has an artist project that they actively tour, or at least actively toured at one time. Maybe now they've had some kids and they don't want to tour so much anymore, so they're like, how do I write for sync? But um, it's very common. Um, but I think... Um, and it's like film or... Podcasts or it's it honestly it's more about it's I think it's less about being an artist and more about sort of the the genre of music that you make that helps kind of us figure out where it's strongest and like when when an artist comes to me and like sends me some of their songs to listen to I'm almost immediately going to be like most of this is really strong for film or TV and like even when I'm thinking about TV I'm thinking about different types of TV shows, like an artist who's really great for Grey's Anatomy, which is still on the air, amazingly. <laughs> Recently got a license for that, was shocked um, that that's still on the air, but it is. So like an artist who's great for that is not necessarily also great for like Poker Face, do you know what I mean? Like those shows use very different music, um, but to me, if I'm listening to an artist and thinking about film, I mean, film, a lot of film is very emotional they have longer scenes there's like more time for a song to breathe that's like one thing that you kind of think about when you think about what might work for film there needs to be build but maybe it can be a slower build it doesn't have to be like we're hitting these little 10 second builds and that's what makes this song a great song for ads or promos you know what i mean so i think you know it's it's sort of just something that like as a pitch person you learn over time because you see the briefs and you kind of identify like the needs are different for this media than they are for that media and then obviously like i said earlier if somebody's popping up across multiple kinds of media that's when you know like this person's about to break through and that sounds like coming into sync across the board which is incredible that's rare like there's not that many things that do that but you know i mean i definitely i will hear a song and i will go that's a good montage song that's not necessarily a great song for an ad or it's a trailer, but it's great for an emotional montage scene in a TV show or a film, you know what I mean? Uh, and you need a longer song for that than you need for a 30 second ad. So um, I think it more depends though, really on both the project that you're pitching to and you know, each artist have, have their strengths. But again, like I said way earlier, like I try to sign a really wide variety of people across a whole bunch of different genres because everybody kind of has their place. And and if somebody writes music that's very specific that I love, but and I'm like, I know this will find a use, but it's not necessarily like the most sync friendly thing. Like it's not what we would call like an obvious sync project. Do you know what I mean? Which is more like somebody who is writing for sync and they're like, I'm just gonna slam out songs about what a great day it is. Like that, you know, that's one thing and we need that. But like if somebody turns in something and I personally am like, I love this music. It's so interesting. The vocals are something that's special, and like I know some supervisor is going to gravitate toward this and use it eventually. Like I would say to that person, I would love to work with you, but like it's not necessarily going to happen in an instant. You know what I mean? Like there, there are some people who just like get synced over and over, and then there are some people who get synced here, and then time passes and they get synced there. You know what I mean? It's not. It just depends, and a lot of it's about the trends and the genre of music that you make. But I also do feel. And this is, I think, important. And like, even when we're working with artists who are writing for sync, it is key to have at least a level of authenticity. 
like you can't write stuff that's so far outside of your comfort zone that like you don't have any mastery over it do you know what i mean and like i do think most supervisors there are a few who i think will just kind of fall back on the same stuff over and over but i do think most supervisors can tell when somebody has like real talent or authenticity in their sound and that will grab them and they might not be able to use you on the project they're working on today but they might come back to it for another film or another show do you know what i mean and we had that happen recently with a girl who has a really unique voice in a songwriting camp thing that I was working on and like she wrote a song for the supervisor for one show that the supervisor was working on and it wasn't really right for that show but the supervisor loved that song and like a year later she came back and licensed it for a completely different show that she was working on because she finally found the spot for it you know what I mean like if you write a great song unless it's like really avant-garde like there is a chance if somebody loves it they will try to find a place to use it you know it's just they have to convince all those other decision makers to get on board too yeah. you've mentioned the songwriting camps do those happen remotely here do you have to go to la for those what is what's involved um i mean there's several groups that do them i'm just part of one of my clients is pen music group and um, they work with a group that's literally called songwriting camps and some of their camps have nothing to do with sync, but they wanted to start doing sync camps, so they asked the pen folks to help them out. And um, we've started doing them three times a year. They are remote, so you don't have to go to LA. We have people from the UK riding on them. Um, the time differences are crazy. There's a woman who lives in like New Zealand that pops up sometimes, and it's like... <laughs> Is it in invitation only, or...? Uh, you have to apply, and then they select you. Um, but they, you know, they need a combination of songwriters, artists, and producers um, who all have some writing skills and then you know they're paired up differently each day and they write stuff um, to these briefs and like I said a lot of times we get amazing songs that don't necessarily get picked for the specific brief that they were writing to but maybe sometimes even another supervisor who wasn't the one who assigned them the brief will like hear it and be like that was great you know what I mean like out at the camp so um, I think those have been uh, for me, like even just watching the process and like hearing the supervisors talk to the songwriters about the briefs and give feedback And that's another thing in this industry like to write for sync You really need a thick skin because they're gonna give you feedback and it's gonna be like Take that out. You know what I mean? Like that's not gonna work for this whether you love it or not And like so you have to be good. You have to be good at feedback. You have to be comfortable with that Which not everybody is but um, you know, I think those are a helpful tool too. Yeah, absolutely. I think we have time for yeah. maybe two more. You have any um for Latin music? Uh, Absolutely. Latin. <laughs> yeah. Do you? Yeah, um, circling back to something I said earlier about how we've been seeing more searches for foreign language music, um, too. I mean, that also extends to genres that are, like, um, sort of um, specific to regions of the country. So I think it's interesting, actually, what you were saying about talking to the advertisers in Portland about using more Portland-based artists. This is, like, a good time, I think, to be having that conversation because I think a lot of the younger supervisors are really sort of concerned with using authentic stuff on their projects. So like if this show is set in Mexico, I want all of the artists to be Mexican or at least Mexican American. Do you know what I mean? And like that is a need we're seeing more and more and more. Um, and certainly in advertising, the like Hispanic market is booming. So we get searches. I mean, I've gotten searches within the last month for like T-Mobile that were just for that market. So it had to be in Spanish or Spanglish. You know what I mean? <laughs> Um, so yeah, I mean, there's definitely a need for Latin music, um, for and, sure. And if you're not yourself a producer or a beat maker, you should find yeah someone to collaborate with who can make your stuff turn. Even like remixed, like classic folk sounding stuff, you know, there's there's a lot of variety there. Yeah. Okay, there's somebody else back there who had their hand up? Where were they? This guy's Over. been waiting patiently. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> you're blocked by us, sorry. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I'm Jordan. Uh, singer songwriter. Um, I was wondering, should I use disco as an independent artist? Like, is that something I should sign up for? And like, maybe pitch myself? Is that even how you do that? Go ahead. <laughs> I, that's what I do. Yeah. Disco is really great. I would almost say everybody should sign sign up. I think you could do a trial, and you can look through all the metadata that they ask you to fill out. That's a really good starting point, just even for like building your own schedule for when you go and work with a Mallory. Um, I meticulously fill everything out. The artwork's there. It's like a vault that, as long as you pay the ten bucks a month, will like never go away. So it's such a good. It's I I would say anyone who actually has a catalog that they believe is ready to really start trying to get representation, I highly recommend Disco personally, but maybe there's another perspective. No, no, I agree with that. Um, I was actually wondering how much it costs for an artist because 
for a company, they kind of base it off of like the size of your catalog. So for me, I pay a lot more per month for it um, than Brian does, but obviously it's because I have a ton more audio in my system. So, um, you know, I think, I think that is a nice thing about it though, is that they have like steps of pricing. So for somebody who's just having their own catalog in there, yes, I mean, I really do believe that the smartest thing that Disco did was basically reach out to music supervisors and say, hey, you can re use this system too. And then it became very much a, just upload it to my Disco link. I mean, I every artist that I work with, I have started making them submit all their audio to me through the Disco link that I have so that I don't have to like download it from somewhere else and then upload it. It just saves so much time. And so that's going to make you look like you have your stuff together. And again, all the fields for all that metadata that we were talking about, all those song splits, writers, all that information, it's all there, so you can fill it all in, and then that information gets sent to them, and it, you look much more on top of your game, because you're organized, really organized. That is great. Um, can we have the house lights up? Look, there's people out there. Oh my god. All right. Um, yes, I wanted to get a picture of y'all. Yeah, stage lights off. <laughs> Oh, look, there are people out there. Okay, all right. Everybody say sync licensing. Okay, let's see. Everybody say disco. Okay, everybody raise your arms up in the air. There, nice. Armpit porn. All right, thank you to our incredible guests. stuff. We are lucky to have them in town. Don't tackle them when they come up the stage. But um, I know that you know if there are additional questions that you want to send us after the fact, um, we can put them together and put some answers in the next newsletter so that everybody gets the benefit of them. But um, we're here. We got we got the room for another 25 minutes. So enjoy each other, hang out, and then make sure you come back to next next month's. Um, first Monday where we will be talking about contracts and I think we'll want to talk about you know like contracts in, in licensing what do you yeah. what do you need to remember what are the gotchas so thank you Mara yeah. cool. yeah. thank you Mara <laughs>